Today I want to speak to you on the subject of what is the difference between the last days and the end times. Uh, many would hear those terms that are students of the Bible and think, well, aren't they basically the same? Or are they synonymous? And the uh, short answer to that is, no, they're not. And so I touched upon this in one of the studies that I just recently posted. If you haven't listened to it, be sure to go back and listen to the teaching on evidences that we are living in the last days. But in that teaching on evidences that we are living in the last days, I touched upon the last days and the end times and I touched it briefly, but made a promise that I would come back uh, because of the significance of those two biblical terms, in, uh, especially in Bible prophecy, and bring some clarity. So let's begin reading today in Isaiah chapter 46, beginning to read at verse 9 and reading through verse 10. The great prophet Isaiah of the Old Testament the 46th chapter, verses 9 and 10, I'm reading today out of the New Living Translation. Remember the things I have done in the past, for I alone am God. I am God, and there is none like me. Only I can tell you the future before it even happens. Everything I plan will come to pass, for I do whatever I wish. And highlight those words, only I can tell you the future before it ever happens. And that is exactly what is in this Bible that I hold in my hands. About 27% of the Bible is prophetic content which separates it from all other religions and all other sacred writings. And because we are living in the final chapters, as it would seem, of Bible prophecy, it is more important than ever before that you understand some of the key components and key terms so that you can understand Bible prophecy much better. And today that's what we're going to do. I'm just going to focus upon two things. What are the last days and what are the end times? What are the last days and what are the end times? Just before we get into that study, let me take a moment to pray for you. And by the way, if you're listening, maybe the first time that you and I have ever connected, there's nothing more important in all of the world than being able to lay your head to the pillow at the end of every day and know that your heart is right with God, to know that you're ready for these prophetic hours in which we live, that you might maybe for the first time have peace with God and the assurance that all of your sins are forgiven. You can have that today. The Bible still says all who call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And so can I ask you to be patient because in every single teaching that I do, on every single social media format, I never teach, I never share, we never study together where I don't give you an opportunity to pray with me what many people might call a sinner's prayer, and we'll do that today at the end of the broadcast, because that's what's most important to me today concerning you and I is that you're living every day ready to meet the Lord. And so if you don't have that peace, be patient. And at the end, I'd like to have the privilege of praying with you. But let's begin as we always do and as we always should. When we open the Bible, we should look to God for guidance and for the help of the Holy Spirit. Father, we do pause and humble our hearts and give you praise. You are great and greatly to be praised. And the greatest decision in all of my life is the decision I made to turn from sin and turn to Christ. And through Christ and through the teachings of Christ and through the teachings of the Holy Bible that I hold in my hand, like a compass, you have guided me throughout the entirety of my life. 
Many that are listening need the encouragement and help and wisdom and guidance that only you can provide. And so I pray that today by the anointing of the Holy Spirit that you would quicken my mind and my words and help me to communicate in a way that is very clear regardless of who may be listening. And at the end of our time together, when I extend the invitation, I pray that you would give individuals the faith and the courage to do what they ought to do today, to turn from sin and turn to Christ and to receive the gift of salvation by grace and through faith. And for all of these things, we'll be careful to give you the praise and the honor and the glory. For we ask it in Jesus' mighty name and all God's people said, Amen. I believe, and I say I believe, I actually have no doubt about it. Because of my knowledge of the Bible and because of my knowledge of Bible prophecy and knowing what God has foretold in the scriptures, I am absolutely convinced that we are watching the stage being set for the final headlines of Bible prophecy. And having a fundamental knowledge of Bible prophecy is critical for every single 21st century believer. And that is the reason for our ministry. And for those of you that are new and just joining us, I want to do my best to help you to understand Bible prophecy and to understand difficult passages in the Scripture. And to, most of all, place a comfort and a peace in your heart that though we live in perilous times, you can live with an assurance that God's hand is upon your life and God takes good care of all of his children. Throughout my decades of teaching the Bible in over 50 countries of the world, I quite frequently hear people using the terms the last days and the end times interchangeably, and uh, I guess assuming that they are synonymous and refer to the same thing, but without trying to be the theology police, I do want to make it absolutely clear to you today that the last days and the end times within the context of Bible prophecy, those terms are not interchangeable. They have distinct and unique meanings when it comes to both the context and the chronology of final Bible prophecy. And that is the purpose of this study. And uh, it'll not be long. I hope you'll have a Bible, a way of taking notes, a highlighter, as we always ask you to have uh, to all of you that are our new students. Uh, the purpose of this Bible study is just to take you into the scriptures and to give you a greater understanding so that when you see or hear in your conversations with others terms like the last days or the end times, that you'll be able to understand exactly what was intended in the scripture. And by the way, if you're one of our new students, and I understand that uh, somewhere between 100 and 200,000 people every month study the Bible with us, at least once a month, and many of you are brand new students, and you'll hear me many times talk about teaching on eschatology or as students of eschatology, and I try to be mindful of the fact that the average person in our world may have never heard uh, the term or the word eschatology. Eschatology is simply a word that defines the field of study that pertains to Bible prophecy and final events. So if you're a brand new student and you want to write that down, eschatology, E-S-C-H-A-T-O-L-O-G-Y, eschatology is a field of study that focuses upon final events or final Bible prophecy. Let's begin. Two questions today, and that's all we're going to cover. I hope I can cover it well. Those two questions that we're going to cover in this study, if you're taking notes, number one, what are the last days? What are the last days? And then secondly, we're going to answer the question, what are 
the end times. Those are the only two things that we're covering today. Take good notes. They're important. Number one, what are the last days? Now, to properly answer that question, you have to first understand that the Bible deals with two distinct covenants. Now, there are multiple covenants in the Bible, but the totality of the Bible addresses two very distinct covenants. And we have an Old Testament and we have a New Testament. And the Old Testament primarily deals with the covenant that God made with the nation of Israel and with the Jewish people. The New Testament is a new covenant and it primarily deals with the church and the church age. It's very important in your understanding of Bible prophecy that you have that in your understanding and like a set of glasses when you read the Bible, you should always have that knowledge as a lens to look through because it'll help you to be a better student. It'll help you to better understand what you're reading. But when it comes to eschatology or Bible prophecy, it is vitally important that you understand that God in the scripture is primarily dealing with two covenants. And even in Bible prophecy, those two covenants are visible. The covenant that God has made with the nation of Israel and the Jewish people, primarily seen in the Old Testament, and the covenant that God has made with Gentiles who were allowed into the family of God. We were adopted and grafted into uh, another covenant by Jesus Christ and His shed blood on the cross his death, his burial, his resurrection has provided for us a covenant with what is called the church age. So if you're writing notes, two covenants. One covenant God has made with the nation of Israel and the Jewish people. The second covenant that God has made is with believers who live in the church age, which is the present age. And I use the word primarily. When I said primarily in the Old Testament, God deals with Israel and the Jews, and primarily in the New Testament, God deals with the church age and believers. But I do want to pause long enough to emphasize the word primarily, because if I don't, there will be hundreds of comments of uh, people who will attack and come out of their little basements and uh, write comments and saying, that's not true. And I was very specific in using the word primarily and not exclusively. So yes, I do understand that even in the New Testament, we have references to the nation of Israel, to the Jewish people, to God's prophetic everlasting covenant with them, well aware of that. But I'm trying to generalize to help new students of the Bible because I don't like people to get lost in the weeds of deep theology. And so as a new student of the Bible, two covenants, one primarily in the Old Testament that deals with Israel and the Jewish people in the New Testament, a new covenant that primarily deals because of Christ with the birth of the church age and Gentile believers grafted in and again well aware of the fact that Israel and the Jewish people are woven through and referenced even in the new covenant and of course in Bible prophecy. Now the Bible uses certain terms in certain ways. So when we speak of the last days, we are speaking of the last days of the church age, which we are currently living in. But when we speak of the last days in reference to the covenant that deals with Israel, we are dealing with different events and different chronology. So I want you to write this down. I sat down and I wanted to come up with a little gold nugget sentence that I feel is very important. And so I'll repeat it a couple of times, but write this down in your life notes. We are currently living in the last 
days. We are currently living in the last days of the church. But the last days for Israel are still in the future. This is one of the most important sentences that will help you in understanding all of what I'm teaching today. So let me say it again. We are currently, you and I right now, we are currently living in the last days of the church. But the last days for Israel are still in the future. Now, if you wrote that down, and it's not difficult, you can teach it to your children. But once you understand that, that we as believers are living, and even unbelievers, whether they've received Christ or not, they're living in what is called in theology the church age. Now, for all of the new students, when did the church age begin? In the Old Covenant or the Old Testament, they were veiled in mystery from ever seeing the church. And the book of Ephesians actually speaks of that, that the Old Testament prophets were kept in a place of being veiled and in a place of mystery. They were not allowed to see the church age. But the Bible tells us in Hebrews in the first chapter that God now in these last days in the church age has spoke to us through his only begotten son. And so the church age began with the first advent of Christ. It was inaugurated in the book of Acts and the second chapter. That's where we see the actual inauguration of the church. And the church age concludes with the next major prophetic event, which is the rapture. The church age began with Christ, inaugurated in the upper room in Acts chapter 2. It concludes with the rapture of the church. We are currently living in the church age. And specifically, the church age is the last days. When you see the term in the Bible, the last days, it primarily is speaking of the church age. And so we are actually living in the last days of the last days as we approach the rapture of the church. And as we study the New Testament, we see this language borne out that supports exactly what I'm teaching you. Because the language of the church age throughout the New Testament is defined by terms such as final days, last days, last hours, and these are synonymous. So when you're reading the New Testament within the context of understanding that the church age began in the upper room in Acts chapter 2, it concludes with the rapture of the church. We are still living in the church age. It helps you to better understand the reading of the terms, the final days, the last days, or the last hour. You see, the early church authors of the New Testament spoke with a language of urgency. You know, people say, well, you know, they said the last days all the way back in the first century. Were they lying or were they deceived? Neither. They were living with such a passionate sense of urgency. You see, one of the things that I've taught you, and if you're a new student, let me go back to it quickly. When it comes to the church age and the next major prophetic event, which is the rapture of the church, I have taught this over and over and over again, but if you're hearing it for the first time, here it is, don't miss it. The church age is not defined by exact detailed prophetic events. You'll oftentimes hear me say that the rapture is a signless event. There are no absolute. Now, Jesus spoke of earthquakes. He spoke of wars. He spoke of pandemics. He spoke of multiple things that are going to be fulfilled after the rapture of the church. 
Uh, now we see these things. We, we're living in perilous times. We see this incredible growth and fulfillment of like birth pains, wars, and pandemics, and famines, and natural disasters, and so on that Jesus taught us. But those, though we see them visible in the church age, they are not specifically in their timing fulfilled in the church age. They are fulfilled after the rapture of the church. So again, for clarity, the rapture is a signless event. And because the authors of the New Testament, as they were writing, were veiled, Matthew 24, 36, no man knows the day nor the hour that the Son of Man will return, no, not the angels in heaven, but my Father only. Jesus said, my Father only. The New Testament authors didn't know. But as it was revealed to them by the Holy Spirit, they lived with a passionate sense of urgency. Well, what if the Lord comes tomorrow? So it wasn't that they were liars, and it wasn't that they were misguided, and it wasn't that they were wrong. The very, don't miss this, the very essence of Bible prophecy has eminence with it, has urgency with it. And it's actually said in the scriptures that in the last days, people would say, hey, I don't believe Bible prophecy. People have been teaching that and preaching that since the first century. They taught that in the church I grew up in. My grandfather believed that. None of that has ever come to pass. They're dead and gone. None of it was ever fulfilled. The Bible actually tells us that in the last days that there would be this rising sense of mockery. Jesus said he's coming back, did he? Well, then where is he? But the New Testament authors, just as we should today, lived with a sense of urgency that the rapture was eminent. In other words, no man knows the day nor the hour. Like a thief in the night, it could happen at any moment. That's how we should live. Now, the author of the book of Hebrews actually referred to the church age as the last days or as the final days. Let me take you back into the Bible and let me give you some key passages of Scripture uh, that pertain to this study, Hebrews and the first chapter and verses 1 and 2. Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. Now, the author of the Hebrews is debated. We don't know for absolute certainty as to who wrote the book of Hebrews. But in Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 and 2, the author wrote this. Long ago, God spoke many times and in many ways to our ancestors through the prophets. Pause right there. Verse 1, Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1, is a clear reference to the Old Testament and the Old Testament prophets and authors. Long ago, God spoke many times in many ways to our ancestors through the prophets. Verse 2, and now in these Final days, that speaks of the church age, the last days. And now in these final days, he has spoken to us through his son. God promised everything to the son as an inheritance. And through the son, he created the universe. The apostle Peter referred to the church as the last days. Uh, go a little further into uh, 1 Peter First Peter chapter 1 and go down to verses 18 through 20. First Peter chapter 1 verses 18 through 20. There the Bible says, For you know that God paid a ransom to save you from the empty life you inherited from your ancestors. And it was not paid with mere gold or silver which lose their value. It was the precious blood of Christ, the sinless, spotless, Lamb of God. God chose him as your ransom long before the world began, but now in these last days. Highlight that. But now in these last days, he has been revealed for your sake. 
And then John, in 1 John uh, chapter 2, 1 John chapter 2 and verse 18, he also spoke about the church age as the last days or the last hour. 1 John chapter 2 and verse 18, there the Bible says, Dear children, the last hour is here. You have heard that the Antichrist is coming, and already many such Antichrists have appeared. From this we know that the last hour has come. So since the entire church age is referred to in the New Testament as the last days, then you and I are specifically living in the last days. So if someone asks me, you know, many times people will ask me, they'll say, Tiff, do you think we're living in the last days? Do you think these are the end times? They're not synonymous. So the answer to that question would be yes and no. Yes, we're living in the last days, but when it comes to the end times, as you're about to learn, that means something different. And it's important that you understand this. This is not tedium. This is not getting buried in minutia. This is vitally important in helping bring clarity to your reading of Bible prophecy and to your understanding of the New Testament and even the Old Testament. If you don't have a fundamental understanding of the differences between the last days and the end times, then when you read the Bible without that knowledge, and especially in Bible prophecy, you're going to have some questions and seeming contradictions. Yes, we are living in the last days. So in your notes at this point, the last days, now again, primarily, primarily in the New Testament, the last days refers to the church age. The church age is what? It was conceived, it was initiated with the first advent of Christ, it was brought into birth in Acts chapter 2, and it concludes with the rapture of the church. And the last days in the New Testament is referred to within the context of the church age. And so at this point, the last days is primarily the church age. Now, why do I say primarily? Because in the Old Testament, the last day speaks of the last days of God's dealings with Israel. And so that's why I don't use the word exclusively because uh, technically I could confuse people if they say, well, every time you see the term the last days in the Bible, it's speaking of the New Testament and the church age. No, there are also the last days for Israel. But the last days in the New Testament, in the New Covenant, the last days refers to the church age. So the last days in the New Testament refers to the church age, and the end times refer to the final events after the rapture, primarily pertaining to Israel and to the Jewish people. Question number one, what are the last days? We've already covered that. The last days within the context of the New Testament and New Testament prophecy is the church age. The church age began with Christ, inaugurated in Acts chapter 2, ends with the rapture of the church. All believers are now living in the church age, which is the last days. These are the last days, and we're living in the last days of the last days. Question number two, what are the end times? Write that down in your life notes. What are the end times? We've already covered, uh, if anything, I've, I've gone over it and over it and over it. I want it to be branded. I also realize uh, the more that I teach that there are a lot of people that the Bible is so brand new to them that I'm not trying, if you're a seasoned believer of 20, 30, 40, 50 years, uh, please excuse some of the times where I'm repetitive. If I'm repetitive in our sessions, in our studies together, it is for divine purpose. I have become more repetitive as I've gotten older 
because I've realized that for a lot of people, they can't keep up and they say, man, can you go back and cover that again? Or I was writing notes and I missed that. Anytime you hear me repeat something over and over and over, that should be a clue to you that I'm giving you gold nuggets. Just like when in the Bible, Jesus repeated things. Anytime Christ in the Bible or any of the authors in the Bible repeated something, if you're smart, you should understand they weren't wasting time or words or parchment and ink. They repeated it because it was a gold nugget that needed to be carefully learned in mind. Question number two, what are the end times? Now, when you see the end times in the Bible, the term end times, when you see end times in the Bible, it has a broader, more general application. And I do want you to write that down. The last days in the New Testament refers to the church age. But the end times, as we see that, has a more broad or general application. When you see last days in the Bible, it is referring to something more specific. When you see the last days in the Bible, it is referring to something more specific. But when you read in the Bible end times, it is more general in its application. Because when we use the word end, just by the nature of the word, it has multiple applications, even in our own lives. Uh, there will today, if the Lord tarries, there'll be an end of this work day. Uh, there will be an end of this week that we're currently in. There will be an end of the month. There will be an end of the year. There will be, if the Lord tarries, an end of of life. And in a few moments, there will be an end to this Bible study. So end by its very nature has general application. But always remember this, the Bible is a Jewish book. The Bible is a Jewish book and it is given with Jewish account. Do you know that there are 66 books in this Bible? All of the authors in the entirety of the Bible were Jewish, except for, and there's debate, there's debate as to whether Luke in the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, the doctor that Jesus handpicked as a follower, there's debate as to whether he was Jewish or Hellenized Jewish, etc. But let's just give Luke the benefit of the doubt and say he wasn't Jewish. 65 of the 66 books in the Bible are definitively Jewish. Jesus, the Messiah, was Jewish. Our soon coming king is Jewish. He will rule and reign from Jerusalem, Israel. Jerusalem will be the capital of the world in the millennium and throughout eternity. So if you're going to be a growing student of the Bible, you must always put on a set of Jewish glasses. And by that I mean you need to understand Jewish context. It wasn't written in an American point of view. It wasn't wit written in a Western point of view. The Bible is by nature Jewish. Now, the Jewish view of prophecy, which you also need to understand as a student of Bible prophecy, let me bring application to that. Because the Bible is Jewish, because all of the authors in the Bible are Jewish, perhaps save one, you need to understand the Jewish view of history. Because the Jews viewed history and the future within the context of two different ages. The first was the present age. The Jews saw all of the time, both past, present, future. They saw it in two distinct ages. They saw it as the present age, and that included uh, while they were waiting for the coming of the Messiah. The second age for the Jewish culture was the age to come. And the age to come 
was defined by the revelation of the Messiah. All of the promises, all of the covenants that had been given to them by God and promised by the arrival of the Messiah. That was the age to come. So in your life notes, at least have this much. The Jewish culture, the Jewish nation, views history in two ages, the present age and the age to come. The present age was all time prior to the revelation of the Messiah, and the age to come is after the revelation of the Messiah's coming. And we see an example of this in uh, Deuteronomy. In fact, uh, take the time to go with me and mark this in your Bible in the Old Testament. Deuteronomy and the fourth chapter. Deuteronomy and the fourth chapter. Go down to verse 30. There the Bible says, when you are in distress. Now remember, where are we reading? This will give you a practical application of something you should have learned today. Where are we reading? Deuteronomy. Is it in the Old Testament or the New Testament? Old Testament. Was the Old Testament God's covenant with the Jews? Or did it speak and define the church age? No, the church age, Tiff, didn't come about until the first advent of Christ, inaugurated in Acts chapter 2. It ends with the rapture of the church. So we're dealing with the Old Testament covenant. It has to be seen through Jewish context. A plus. Great job. So because we're in Deuteronomy chapter 4, we're reading about Jews. Deuteronomy 4.30, when you are in distress and all these things have come upon you in the latter days or last days, you will return to the Lord your God and listen to his voice. Now the English word distress is the Hebrew word for tribulation. And so in Deuteronomy chapter 4, there is actually the mention of the distress upon the Jews when? During the tribulation <clears throat> period. So in context, this puts the Jews in the tribulation period in the latter days or the end times. Now remember, in the New Testament, last days refers to the church age. But in the Old Testament, as I've already said, End times, latter days, last days, uh, end of the age. There are Old Testament terms, but they don't refer to the church age. They refer to the Jewish covenant. And so the prophet Daniel uses a series. Uh, when I say a series, multiple terms, multiple times referring to the Jews and almost without exception placing them in the time of distress or in the tribulation period. Uh, like, for example, if you want to write them down, <clears throat> terms like end of time. Uh, that's, where, <clears throat> that's where the theological term oftentimes uh, evolves end times uh, because there's references to it throughout the Old Testament. Daniel multiple times. Daniel references a term end of times in Daniel chapter 8. Verse 17, Daniel chapter uh, 12 and verse 4, uh, I believe also down in verse 9, uh, he uses the term end of the age in Daniel chapter 12 and verse 13. In Daniel chapter 12 and verse 4, Daniel tells us that the teachings about the end times will be sealed up for the Jewish people until the end of of time. So remember that in the Old Testament, the end times or latter days refer specifically to the end of time, last days for Israel, which is the tribulation. Again, bringing you back to the same points over and over to make sure I don't lose you. End times is a broader term. And so we see in the Old Testament, end of times, uh, latter days, uh, end of the age, and so on, as I've already given to you. This is speaking to Israel. And when is that period of time? It's always, don't forget this, always without exception, 
after the rapture and during the tribulation period. As I mentioned to you out of Deuteronomy chapter 4, which is why I took the time to read that verse and asked you to mark it in your Bible. The word distress, I hope you highlighted it. The word distress in the Hebrew is the word tribulation. And the Jews in context in the end times, latter days, last days, end of the age, end of times, always in the tribulation period. So in conclusion, I want you to remember that in the Old Testament, the end times of the latter days refers to the last days for Israel. And that includes the tribulation period, the second coming of Christ, and the millennial kingdom. The last days for the church began at the first coming of Christ, ends at the rapture of the church, end times or last days for Israel begins at the beginning of the great tribulation and ends with the millennial kingdom. So I've tried to cover that carefully. I've tried to put enough depth in it that you'll get rooted in understanding. We've walked you into multiple passages of Scripture to lay down biblical foundation for everything that we've taught you. So now you understand why the last days and the end times are not interchangeable. You've learned that there's last days in the Old Testament, but it is totally different than the last days of the New Testament. The last days of the New Testament is always in reference to the church age, and the church age began with the first advent of Christ, inaugurated in Acts chapter 2, ends with the rapture of the church, Technically, in the New Testament, if you want to use those terms properly, the last days in the New Testament context refers to the church age. And then you've learned that the end times is a broader term that oftentimes is always pointing towards the Jewish covenant. And it refers to the dealing of God with the Jewish nation after the revelation of the Messiah, after the revelation of the Messiah, which for them will be during the tribulation. It will be during the tribulation that Christ will be recognized by the Jewish nation of Israel as the promised Messiah fulfilled. And as they go through that time of distress, as was said in Deuteronomy or tribulation, that is specifically the end times for the Jews. Always remember that in our study of Bible prophecy. There are two covenants in the Bible, a covenant with the Israel, a covenant with the Jewish people, primarily Old Testament, a covenant with the church age in the New Testament. God fulfills all of his covenants. But when we speak of the last days in the New Testament, it's the church age. When we speak of end times, primarily we are talking about the Jewish nation, Israel, the Jewish people, during the tribulation and on into the second coming of Christ and the millennial reign. Those are the end times for God's original covenant with the Jewish people. And now you know that the last days and the end times are not synonyms. They are not interchangeable. And now... Hopefully, if I've done my job, you know why. Most importantly, as you've heard me say, I don't know how many times, the purpose of our studying the Bible together is not just to learn scholarship, not just to uh, add more Bible knowledge to the IQ of our spiritual discernment. Most importantly, Bible prophecy should motivate us to live ready to meet the Lord. Are you living ready to meet the Lord? I promised you at the beginning of this study that I'd like to pray with you. And so if you're listening, perhaps God, as he's done thousands of times in recent weeks, has led you to this time of Bible study, maybe to our YouTube channel, maybe you're listening to our podcast channel, maybe you're listening to Facebook Live, wherever you're listening. It wasn't accidental. God brought you here today because you need to be ready to meet the Lord in these last days. 
All you need to do is from your heart, pray with me. And when you're done praying, I want you to go to our website, lostlamb.org. It's on the screen. Be sure to click on New Beginnings. There's help for you there and follow up. But let's begin by making peace with God. Pray with me. Just say, Heavenly Father, today as I was listening to the Bible, you were speaking to me. Down deep in my heart, I want to live ready in these last days. I want to be ready for the soon coming of Christ. And so today I acknowledge my sin and I repent. In childlike faith, I turn my back on sin and I turn my heart to Jesus Christ. Come into my heart. Be my Lord and Savior. I vow this day to live for you. Fill me with the Holy Spirit and give me your power. Now according to your word which cannot lie, today I'm saved. Today I'm forgiven. Today I'm delivered and I am healed and I'll never be the same. In Jesus' mighty name, amen and amen.